look, you never want to fail, then never risk, right? That, that's a guarantee of no failure. You don't risk. If you never want to live, don't risk. Because that's, that's a guarantee that you will not live a full abundant life. Brett, thank you so much for stopping by the Or to the Wise podcast. I'm so excited to have you here and speak with you. It's a thrill to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So, Brett, you have over uh, 35 years experience coaching and advising executives, entrepreneurs, professional athletes, and so on. And you're also the founder of the Rudius Strategy Group, which is a coaching and consulting firm that helps people find purpose and perform to their fullest potential. And I'm really curious to know what interested you in this line of work? Well, let, let me uh, kind of split it between two lines of work, if you will, right? Okay. So 35 years, um, I was a wealth manager or, so, you know, in helping clients with various forms of their wealth. Um, and as you, as you said, you know, a lot of these were executives, very, very well off people, uh, entertainers, athletes, and what have you. There was also some times when I was in what's called a single family office and, and a single family office is literally having a staff of people that just handle one family's family affairs. Okay. So that's the 35 years. And then two years ago, I retired into my next uh, career, which is in the coaching. I wrote a book and what have you. So the first part of, of, of my career launching was, you know, just like everyone else, I was trying to figure out what, what am I going to do with my life? You know, back in, in college and, and leading up to that, um, I, I grew up here in Los Angeles. I still live here in Los Angeles. And, and one of the things that, uh, that, that was my family upbringing was that my father was a city of Los Angeles surveyor, which means that he was really, a, you know, a blue collar worker. And, and I didn't, I came from an environment that didn't really deal with, you know, white collar work and, and what have you. And so I remember as a kid driving by Century City, which is in Los Angeles and, and looking at one of those buildings and saying to myself, you know, one of these days, maybe I'd like to work in one of those buildings, not knowing what was there. Um, I went to school, I, I graduated, um, I got a job and lo and behold, I literally was at a firm that was, you know, in, in one of those buildings that I passed by. I didn't, I didn't realize it until later, but that was kind of the case. And, and, you know, how I got into it was really, you know, a focus on, on uh, a professional career. I was interested in, in uh, you know, the business world and that's where I landed and, and ultimately ended up serving these very, very successful people. So that's one side of it. Um, after 35 years or in the midst of 35 years of, of working with these folks, I, there was a few things that happened to me. Number one, being exposed to very successful people um, it gives you a lot of insights into things, both good and bad, believe it or not, right? I mean, the good side of things was that, you know, I learned some things about how they conducted themselves or what they did in business and what have you. I also learned, though, that, you know, not everyone is all that happy, no matter how much wealth that they have, right? And, and what I found was that in many cases, I was not a wealth manager alone in terms of just their financial affairs, but I found myself advising them on the non-financial wealth areas of life, things like um, relational wealth and physical wealth and emotional wealth and these kinds of things. And, and ultimately, when I retired, I, I decided that instead of taking a lot of these things that I had learned throughout my career and just taking them to my grave or just sharing them with a small group of my family, I would, you know, coach and consult and help others either through writing a book, which I did, and or, you know, consulting and doing some coaching. So, you know, that's that's the the long version uh, of how I got into, you know, these two areas of my life. Very interesting. And I have so many questions for you. And I really want to dive into your book called The Delta Theorem a little bit later into the episode, but something that you are passionate about um, and you just touched on then is like purpose, wealth, and performance. And I want to start off with the purpose 
part of the conversation because you know when people hear purpose that's like a um a buzzword right people are always trying to figure out what is my purpose what can I do for work that aligns with my values and brings me joy and you were talking about you know in your work you know you met a lot of wealthy people but they weren't always necessarily happy so I want to start off with what is your definition of purpose you know purpose is that is that thing that is the intersection of three other areas of life okay your priorities, your principles, and your passion. Here's what I find, and I think you alluded to this to a certain degree. You ask anybody, let's say I ask you right now, tell me what your purpose is. There is a high probability that I will get back a deer in headlights kind of response. Like, I don't know. And frankly, I haven't thought about it because it's too big of a question for me to tackle. And by the way, if I tell you what it is, does that mean that it can never change? And that is that optionality is very daunting to people. And so I found in my own life, as well as when I'm working with others, that they don't, they are haven't or don't take the time to find out what the Japanese call their ikigai, their reason for being, their one thing. But as I alluded to, if I ask you, tell me what your priorities are, you can probably come up with those. Well, are you married? Are you not married? Uh, Do you have a career? Do you have a family? Do you have children? All these things that are the most important things in your life, people come up with those. If I ask you, tell me what your principles are. What are those things that you absolutely are non-negotiables in your life. You likely can have what those are and they come from various places. Maybe it's family of origin or it could be a religious or spiritual upbringing, but you have some principles that you just stick with no matter what. And then finally, if I say, listen, tell me what makes you come alive. What is the thing that you just, your hair is on fire. That's what passion is, right? If you think of those things or the way that I think of them and what I have found is that in my own life, when I looked at each one of those three Ps and I treated them like Olympic rings and found that place where all three of them overlapped right in the middle, that was where purpose started to come alive. And and that is where, you know, somebody's reason for being that they can say, you know, is where that purpose is. And once somebody has that powerful why, well, then a lot of things just change in life as as we know. So, you know, that's what I do with clients. That's what I did for 35 years is helping people find out what it was. You know, my clients had mega wealth, you know, kind of uh, situations. They were, they were flying in private jets and, and, you know, had significant amount of capital, but it didn't mean that they felt that contentment. And they also didn't necessarily know what their purpose was with that wealth. So working with them around their priorities, their principles, and their passion starts to reveal what it is that that is that powerful why for what somebody wants to do with their lives. Right. I love that. Priorities, principles, and passion Passion. gets you to your why. And I think you touched on something too that I wanted to ask about, which is what I struggle with or what scares me is like, okay, once I define my purpose, does it mean it can't move? Because I'm someone who's multi-passionate. So I have lots of different things that light me up. I think at my core, there is a pattern for sure. But I'm always like, okay, once I define my purpose, am I stuck with it? And I think a lot of people struggle with the idea of being stuck to a purpose. And then they start overthinking and ruminating, like, am I sure this is my purpose? So how do you, you know, get people through that? Yeah. The thing that that I talked about uh, as it pertains to priorities is just think about that. Priorities are things that change with life events, right? The things that I I said previously, are you married? Are you not married? You know, are you in college? Even for a young person, are you educated? Do you have children? These kinds of things. They are based on life stages. And guess what happens with life stages? They change. So here's a good example for my own life. 
right? If I look back and I said, what was, what did I think my purpose was 20 years ago? My purpose at that time was to be a great husband, a, a father to a daughter that could train her up in the way she should go and to have some level of success in my career. Because at that life stage, I had a young daughter. I was married for you know 15 years or so, and I was in the middle of my career. Today, I'm now have a daughter that's adulting and launched. You know, I've been married for 32 years, and I retired from that career that did give me some form of success. And what I find that my purpose is today is to inspire people to come alive. Very different, right? It's about more giving back because my life stage my life stage has changed. And so that's why priorities are so critical as as a component as a foundation for purpose because you know as your life stage changes and you have diversity of thought and that kind of stuff, you have the ability in your own life to say, okay, now my purpose can be very different than what it was, you know, just a few years ago and what have you. I love how you just explained that because as you were talking and as I asked you the question, I was also kind of thinking for myself too, that I assume that people's um, purpose kind of shifts depending on what chapter they are in their life. So I like how you said that in terms of priorities like where are you right now in your life what are your priorities and that can kind of give you a sense of what your purpose is I'm curious though does purpose always have to align with career and what someone does to make money no no by by no means at all I mean you know uh, we we have different roles that we all play in life I I identified you know, three different roles of uh, in, in what I just said, father, husband, and uh, employee. I, I, you know, I was not, well, I was the owner of a business, but I was not the sole owner of the business. And so, you know, within those, they had different roles. And so, no, it's not just associated with career. It's, you know, you should have a, a powerful why for your physical health. You know, several years ago, I, I, I recognize that one of the things in my post wealth management career that I likely should plan for was to get a certification as a coach. You know, I I don't it's it's not necessary, but I found that if I'm going to, you know, sit down with somebody and say, "Hey, I want to coach you," you know, it would be very easy to just say because I have all this life experience. Well, you know, did I really put in the discipline to learn what it means to be a coach? So I went through a program that was run by a former Navy SEAL. And this Navy SEALs program required us to learn not only the skills around how you ask questions as a coach, but it also forced us to deal with our own physical health, as you could imagine, a Navy SEAL might do that. And, and it required us to learn how to um, basically complete a very difficult crucible from a physical you know, space. Now, the only way I was able to get through that is to have a very powerful why as to why I was getting up at four in the morning to do, you know, a hundred burpees, which are, you know, crazy in and of themselves, or why was I, you know, running um, through water in the cold of, of the winter, because I knew that I needed to complete this particular crucible event. And in order for me to do that, I had to have a very powerful why purpose as to why I wanted to do that. And so in that particular case, my why was because I want to get a coaching certification. You know, it may sound like it was career. It wasn't. It had a lot to do with my physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health, which is what, you know, is where the real wealth and true wealth, you know, comes into play. So, yeah, it's not just career. It's it's in all areas of life. I like that you just mentioned wealth because I, I wanted to kind of zero in on that aspect of the work that you do, right? So as you said before, working as a wealth manager, you came across a lot of wealthy people. 
but not all of them were happy. I want to talk about, first and foremost, why do you think they were not happy? Because a lot of people think that once you have a lot of money, you have access to different things, there's so much joy in life, right? But why do you think they were, you know, dealing with unhappiness? And I would also like to touch on your definition of what it means to be truly wealthy. Yeah. So one of the things that I found was that money solves a lot of problems for people, but it doesn't necessarily compensate for some of the worries or concerns in people's life. So for instance, you know, some of my clients had, as I said, just tremendous amounts of wealth. And what they'd come to me and say to me is this, I'm really concerned about what the wealth is going to do to my kids. I'm really concerned about that. I didn't have this wealth when I was growing up. I earned this wealth. I worked hard to get it. But my children, they have had this wealth. And that worry or concern, which is a legit concern, right, is a component of relational wealth, right? It was about their relationship with their kids or their spouse or friends. You know, that is relational wealth that would inevitably come up with, you know, within the context of, of working with some of these clients. They also might say something like, gosh, you know, I, I have all this money, but I'm working like a dog and my health is horrible. I don't have time to do, you know, believe it or not, I don't have time to, you know, work out or or to to sleep well or these kinds of things. So there's physical wealth that's inside of it. You know, in some cases they really just didn't have this this notion of legacy. They wanted to have a legacy. They believed that their wealth could provide a certain level of legacy. It could be something like, you know, donating, you know, some of their their finances for uh, betterment of mankind and that kind of stuff. But just this notion of spiritual or legacy wealth was also a component of things. And of course, there's just like the mental wealth. I mean, we've all been there. I mean, whether we have a ton of money or not, there's a peace of mind that we all are kind of seeking inside of things. And it doesn't matter how much wealth you have or not. Peace of mind is something that is emotionally driven and mentally driven and that kind of thing. So, you know, those were the things that I, I, I saw and learned. It applied my own life too, but certainly with clients that you would think you shouldn't have any problems whatsoever. That's not the case whatsoever. So here's what I define as true wealth. True wealth is where you have that, that, that mixture that I'd say an even balanced mixture between certainly financial wealth, but physical wealth, relational wealth, mental and emotional wealth, and spiritual wealth, and then the wealth of time. It is our only resource that's wasting right? We cannot get back this moment right now. It's gone. And so the wealth of time and just like being able to spend your time well was another component of what I put into, you know, the, the, the whole concept of wealth. And then, you know, I would work with and work with clients now in terms of like, how do we get that balance in your life? You know, how do we not just focus on one area or another? I love the word that you use there, balance, because, you know, as you were talking, I remember, I think two days ago, I was online and I've heard this a couple of times where people who are really, really wealthy, their biggest fear, like you mentioned, is how their child or their children are going to handle this wealth because they grew up in it. So it's like making sure that their character and their value systems aren't just based off of the wealth that they were born into. And then another part of it, too, is just that relational piece, right, where, where someone had said, you know, I can have all the money in the world, but true wealth is when my kids want to come home and spend right. Christmas and Thanksgiving with me. Right. And, you know, when I hear that stuff, it makes me think about the general 
value system or ideology that we grow up with, right? Which is hustle, hustle, hustle. Make sure you reach the top, right? And, but in order to do that, sometimes relationships do fall to the wayside. And like you said, there's time that passes where we're not pouring into our physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual health. So if you were talking to a young person today who's on the grind, right, or even someone who's pretty established in their career or entrepreneurship, whatever they're doing, how would you tell them to kind of make sure that they're balancing out, you know, getting, you know, monetary success and also making sure that they're staying wealthy in all the other crucial parts of their life? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously it's, it's, it's complicated because different situations, you know, are, 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 are different for everyone. You know, I mean, one of the things that's really kind of challenging just as a, as kind of a precursor to answering your question is this, it's very easy for you and I to talk about purpose when we have food that's on the table, right. Or we have clothes or we have shelter and those kinds of things, you know, there's this this notion of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which, you know, at the most base level is just this need for, for just substance, right? And there are some people that don't have that. So to go to them and talk about purpose is almost cruel. I, I mean, I mean that very sincerely, right? It's almost cruel. It's like, wait, you're telling me like, I got to come up with like some powerful, why I, I'm just trying to survive here, you know? So I think that, that it depends on, you know, all those circumstances and us, all of us that need to be empathetic and, and around, you know, finding out what's really going on in somebody's life. But now let's take the individual that's like, you know, where they are right now. There's a couple of things. Number one, you've got to be purposeful. So take the, the person that I, I described who is concerned about what the wealth is going to be do, do, that is going to do to their kids. You know, one of the things that I would say to one client in very particular that, that we did this is I said, listen, your son idolizes you. He absolutely idolizes you. Why? Because the rest of the world does as well. But think about the pressure on your son. Why don't you do this? Why don't you invite your son purposefully into a board meeting that you're running and just say to him, son, sit behind me, you know, just watch what's, what's going on here. Right. Let me, you can ask me things afterwards and that kind of thing. He's got the full uh, authority to be able to do that in that board meeting. It was just that he needed to be very purposeful about inviting his son into his story because then his son's story becomes part of it. So purposeful is very, very important. No matter, you know, if you're older or younger for the younger person, you know, don't just fly by uh, um, um, uh, life, be purposeful around things. The other thing is inside of purpose and purposeful is it's about who, not do. You start with who you are. Who do you want to be? Not doing things. If you don't have this target of who you believe that you are in your identity or who you want to be, then you will just do stuff that cannot all piece together, right? And then there's also this concept of train, not try. We can all try to do stuff. I think it was Yoda that says, you know, um, something like uh, uh, do, there is no try, you know, inside of things. So, you know, try, oh, I tried to do that. No, train yourself to do something. You know, you train yourself to be able to do a crucible event. You train yourself to be a good leader in, in your workplace. You train yourself to be a good follower. And it's in the little dailies that that training actually happens, just like it was in the dailies that I talked about that I was training myself to be a coach. You know, I was purposeful inside of that. And so, you know, that's what I would say. It's who not do, it's train, not try and be purposeful of what you're doing so that you have that end in mind. You know, everything you said, I think is extremely spot on and something else that I wanted to ask you. And I wonder if you work with your clients on this. They seem like pretty established um, people, but I know that when it comes to purpose, sometimes 
some some of us might have certain things within our hearts, but we are afraid to actually walk or step into that purpose. Do you deal with this? Do, you, do your clients have these issues? And, and if so, how do you kind of get them to overcome that fear and really give themselves permission to step into the purpose that they're being called to? Yeah, I look, usually fear is associated with failure, right? It's associated with failure. So it's it's the fear of failure. And yes, many of my clients, you know, have had that fear of failure. We all have that fear of failure. But here's the thing then working with people, and, and this is part of the Delta theorem in the book that I wrote, you know, there's this concept of failure being viewed of as a negative, right? Like we think that our failures are automatic negatives, that we are a failure instead of we fail. Big difference. It's kind of like shame and guilt, right? When you shame, when you feel like shame, it means that, you know, you, you, there's something wrong with you as opposed to guilt is like you did something wrong, right? When you fail, you have failed at something. You're not a failure. But some people shirk back and that fear of that keeps them from moving forward. Instead, take this concept from math and think about negatives that are squared. When you square a negative in math, it becomes a positive. I don't understand it, quite frankly. I'm not a math wizard. But minus two times minus two is plus four. I don't get it, whatever, but it is true. So what if we have this concept that we square up our failures? And how do you square up your failure? By learning from it. I mean, come on. We all know that the greatest learning that we have in our lives are not from our successes. They're from our failures. And so that fear, if turned into, wait a minute, if I'm risking and I'm trying something and it doesn't work out, but I can learn from that so that it can catapult me forward into the next thing, well, then that fear starts to diminish. It's really, really beneficial when you have somebody that's working with you to help you with that. Because I don't know if you're like me, but these little voices that we get that just like continue to bombard us with, no, 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 you're a failure. No, you're a failure, right? Instead of, no, 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 you, you simply failed. Let's learn from this. Let's move forward and let's go from there. So, you know, these are the things that I've worked with my clients and continue to work with clients around just a concept like that. And I think that's beautiful. I think failure definitely propels us to kind of dig deeper and figure out what we did wrong. And I think if we stay on the path towards whatever we're trying to achieve, we will eventually achieve that. I'm a, I'm a strong believer of that. And I think sometimes with purpose too, I think that people, depending on what the purpose is, you know, having to tell family and friends, you know, if it's like something that's more career related, because purpose doesn't always have to relate to career. Right. It's very daunting to kind of bring to your friends and family a purpose that you feel like you need to accomplish with your career that they don't understand. Right. So also I think that breeds um, a lot of fear and takes a lot of courage to, you know, step into that as well, unapologetically. Yeah, look, it's 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 really hard, right? I mean, a lot of times people tell you, okay, come up with a goal or a purpose and tell it to somebody, right? That's the best way to like put it out there because then it'll probably hold you accountable to do it. That's hard. <laughs> yes. Because once you say it, then it's like you have to live it, right? Yeah. And, and it's not that I'm saying that you should or shouldn't. What I'm saying is that the reality is it's very, very difficult. Now, add to that people that have been in your life that there's just triggers for us, right? Parents trigger us, you know, spouses trigger us, uh, 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 siblings trigger us, you know, the, our best friends, they can trigger us too. So now we're opening our heart and sharing it with them. And, you know, you run the risk that they look at you and go, you, 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 you think you can do that, right? It's, it's very, very risky to be able to do that. So I, I recognize that that's the case, but look, you never want to fail, then never risk, right? 
that that's a guarantee of no failure. You don't risk. If you never want to live, don't risk. Because that's, that's a guarantee that you will not live a full abundant life. I, yes. I, I just, that's the way that it is. Yes. Life is a risk for sure. Huge risk. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit now about your book, um, The Delta Theorem, An Innovative Framework for Being Fully Alive and Truly Wealthy. And I know we've touched on a couple of these things throughout our conversation, but I really want to know what made you want to write this book and what are you hoping people are able to get from this book? Well, you know, I, I, it, it is a, the, uh, the culmination of many of the things that we've just talked about. And so I think it's probably best to describe what the Delta theorem is to be able to answer that question, because believe it or not, it's, it's one of these things where the publisher, when I, when I said, this is the title of my book, they said, no, you, you can't have something called the Delta theorem. People are going to look at it and say, is this for engineers? Is this for, you know, who's this for? but you have to go with me and your audience should go with me as well. Okay. Here's what the Delta theorem is. It is literally a math equation. That's not a math equation, but it looks like this alpha over P cubed by E F squared equals Delta. That's what the Delta theorem is. And here's what it means. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. So it stands for a, pers a person's powerful why, their purpose, which we talked about earlier. It sits on a foundation of P cubed, which guess what those are? Priorities, principles, and passion. We talked about that, that the foundation for anybody's powerful why is their priorities, their principles, and their passion. Now, all of that is great and aspirational. I could come up with, going through this process and have this, this tremendously great sounding uh, purpose and put it on a piece of paper and calligraphy and stick it up on my, my shelf and look at it every day. And it does nothing unless you activate it through effort. And so alpha over P cubed by E, and that stands for effort. And so it's the concept of what do we need to do to actually take action to make our purpose come to life. And then finally, F squared, I touched on that. It's the learning that comes from failure because the reality is, is that when we put ourselves out there with effort and a purpose that we believe is what we're meant to be, our reason for being, inevitably we will make mistakes, we will fail. And unless we learn from that failure, we will get stuck. All that equals delta, which in the in the in in terms of mathematics, delta is a symbol for change, for impact, for making a difference. So to answer your question, I recognize that all of us as human beings want to make a difference. I believe that we all know that there is a much larger story that's going on than the story that we live in our lives. Yes, our stories are very large. My story feels very large. As I said, I'm married. I have a daughter. I you know, have a career. I've got a home. I've got some cars. I've got a community. Those are all large story items in my world. But guess what? My world is pretty small. And there's a much larger story that's going on that we all want to tap into. And that is... How can I make an impact on you know, my broader community? How can I make a difference in the lives of people that I come across? You know, How can I change to be able to do these kinds of things? And so the Delta theorem is a framework. It's literally simply a bunch of symbols that are meant to be easy to remember the critical elements that come into what puts you in the best position to create change or make a difference. Now, notice that I said, put you in the best position. None of this is guaranteed. Life is not guaranteed. Things happen. So it's not that you go through this framework and suddenly I'm guaranteed to make a difference or have an impact or be successful or whatever the case is. No, 
but it can put you in a really good position to where those things will come your way. And that's why I wrote the book is to help people, you know, to do that. I brought in a lot of stories from my own life, from clients, from just observations, from things that I've read. You know, I found I'm, I'm a voracious reader. And what I found was that there often were tremendous books that focused just on purpose. There were great books that focused on failure. There's a lot of books on effort. There are books on priorities, but I didn't find anything where all of it was pieced together in a framework that just made sense that you could walk through with somebody or I could coach somebody through or somebody else could coach or parent or mentor or teach someone through to put them in a position to where that thing that we all want to have, which is impact and making a difference actually comes to fruition. You know, as you were talking, you know, about the Delta theorem, which I think is a fantastic way of describing everything that we've been talking about this whole episode. It sounds like purpose a lot of times has to do with service to others. Like when people are having, you know, philosophical conversations and the larger than life conversations, it boils down to two things. Are you going to be of service to others or are you going to be of service to self? And it seems like life is more fulfilling and um, a lot better when we allow ourselves to be of impact to not just ourselves, but others. And that, like you said, you know, being a father and a husband, you are in service in some sort to your family as they are to you. And then in your coaching, you are in service to people wanting to make more of an impact and tap into that purpose. Would you say that is a fair assessment of some of I, what we've been talking about? Absolutely. I think it is, it's, it's absolutely true to, to who we are as, as just human beings. Look, mm -hmm. you know, I, I believe we're made for relationship right yes. now. I am, my wife calls me one of the most fiercely independent people that she knows, right? Mm -hmm. I, I am, I'm fiercely independent, meaning that, you know, I, I, I can, uh, I, I can go through a coaching program and, and, and get up at four in the morning and, and do these things and that kind of stuff, but I'm made for relationship. You know, prior to us getting on this call, I was here by myself. Now look at what's happened, just the two of us inside this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Life starts to happen, right? And hopefully people that are listening, they start to get inspired by these things. That to me is what relationship is all about. Even to the people that I can't see right now and they can't see me. It's about relationship building and it's about, you know, that kind of thing. So yes, giving back, in service to others is, I think, a critical, critical part of everyone's purpose. You know, I really appreciate this conversation. I appreciate all of your insights. I think it's given me a lot to think about as I think about my life and, and my purpose and the things that are my priorities, my, my passions, and what my principles are. I think I have a good sense of it, but I think just kind of thinking deeper about that makes me feel like I have, I will get a better understanding of my purpose and be able to fully work in it. Um, my final question before we get to the final words of wisdom is how do we measure success towards our purpose? I know that you said that, you know, it's not guaranteed, like, you know, following the Delta theorem doesn't mean like we're going to be like, oh yes, I'm fully in my purpose. But Sometimes, even when we are fully in our purpose, we might not know how to measure that. What What do you think a good measuring stick is? Joy and contentment. Mm. Joy and contentment. Okay. And those two things, not happiness, joy and contentment, big difference, yes. right? So for instance, my purpose right now, as I said, is I feel like it's to inspire you know, others to come alive. That's what I, it, you know, it, it makes me want to, it makes me tick right now. Joy and contentment is if one person, just one person buys my book and maybe they even get back with me and says, thank you. That brings me joy and contentment. It's not about numbers. It's not about book sales. It's not about having more. It's about, wow, if my purpose is really simply to inspire others to come fully alive, then that one person 
brings me joy and contentment. It's very, very difficult not to want to measure based on largesse, right? Number of people, number of subscribers, that kind of thing. But if one person is impacted by what can be done and I feel joy and contentment inside of that, then that's what I think the measure of success can truly be. I agree. And I would even add on top of that, which I think alludes to joy and contentment, which is like peace. Yes. Um, just a, a overwhelming sense of peace. Yes. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For sure. Yeah. Peace of mind is, as I said, is a, is a very critical component of wealth. And I think we've all kind of experienced that. Like I yeah. don't have peace of mind and I'm not feeling, you know, emotionally wealthy right now. You know, I'm feeling out of sorts. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's critical. Yeah. And it's priceless funny enough, that feeling. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Brett, thank you so much for being on the show. I always ask my guests for final words of wisdom. You've been dropping a lot of gems on this episode. So I don't know if you still have any left in your back pocket, but any final words of wisdom to the listeners? It could be about what we've been talking about or something completely different that you kind of keep in your back pocket as you go through life. Yeah, you know, um, I've done the work around all of the things I've described in my own life. And, and one of the things that is a critical principle for me is, you know, a, 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 a quote from the scriptures that says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? And, and the work that I've done around that, especially as it ties with wisdom, is looking at that word fear and understanding that better. And what I came to understand is that when it's talking about that fear, it's talking about awe, awe. It's that overwhelming feeling of like, wow, that's the fear of the Lord, right? Like awe of that. And so my words of wisdom, if you will, inside that is actually a story of awe that I experienced for myself. Um, here's what the story is. Several years ago, my father, who had run 60 marathons in his life, um, sent me, a, 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 it called me up and he said, hey, I'm going to run my last marathon because I have a bad hip. And it was going to be the New York marathon. I'd never run a single marathon. I'd always declined. I didn't have the time or whatever the case is. And so I decided secretly that I was going to train and it was going to be his last marathon. It was going to be my first and last probably, right? But I did it as something that I wanted to honor my father. And so I trained for it and 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 went through and secretly behind, you know, he didn't know it. I went and I trained. And, and the way that the training was, you had to get a certain amount of, of miles in. Well, this one particular weekend, I had to run, you know, a certain number of miles and I was up in the mountains and the air was thin and I went for a run and I was gassed basically immediately. Not only was it uphill, but the air was thin. But I remembered as I had started off that I ran past a field. It was like a soccer field and it was flat. And I thought to myself, ah, why not just run there? I'll get my miles in there, right? So I did. And I started running. And as I was running around this, I literally had this feeling that said, Brett, this is just like your life. You're just running in circles. You're going past the same thing every single time and you're playing it safe. And then off to the side, there was this, this, this dirt path. And you probably, we've all seen these dirt paths. They're like rugged. They're, 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 they're rutted with like, you know, water that's gone and they're, they're slippery and that kind of stuff. And I'd run past it and it kind of led off into some of the distance. And I went past it and it was like, go there. That's the thought. Go there. And I was like, no, 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 no. You know, I, I'll, I'll twist an ankle and I can't afford to twist an ankle, whatever the case is. Ran past it again. Again, this thought, this is just like your life. Finally, I listened to that voice, that still small voice. And I went on that path. And here's what happened. That path led me to a creek that was beautiful. It led me to a, a bridge over that creek that was like a single person bridge you could walk over. I would have never have seen that. It led me out to where these trees were and these birds were chirping away. And all I kept thinking to myself was, oh my goodness, this is that awe. 
This is what nature has to offer. This is what I was invited into. And I would have missed it if I didn't have this sense of awe of the Lord. And so fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Awe of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. And so I learned, I learned about taking chances, about risk, about what was in store for me if I would, you know, trust in that awe of the Lord to be able to be the first starting point for wisdom. So, you know, that's that's a personal story that I share with you and your readers and certainly has a tremendous impact on my own life. Brett, that was good. I need to stop. That was so good. I had goosebumps just hearing you tell that story. I, I picked up so many lessons from that. One, obviously, listen to your intuition, listen yes. to, to, to the Holy Spirit as it, yes. as, as, as it speaks to you. Also, don't be afraid to take on a new path and trust that God will make the way much better than you expected. So much in store. So yes. much, so much in, in store. store. Yes. You know, if we, and listen, I was scared to death of, of twisting my ankle and rightly yeah. so like I, then I can't honor my father anymore because I can't train for this. So, you know, we all have these, these correct logical yes. kind of like things, but sometimes you got to risk and yes. sometimes you got to listen to the Holy spirit, just like saying, no, 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 no. Come with me this Trust way. Me. Right. Yes. Trust me. Come with me this way. This is the beginning of wisdom here. So, yeah. Mm, that was good. That was a great way to end out such a powerful episode. No, I believe that my listeners are going to eat all of this up. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you or find out more about your work? Yeah, the easiest way is to go to www.connectwithbrett with one t.com. I made it very simple. Just connectwithbrett.com and there there are links to LinkedIn and 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 X formerly Twitter or whatever they call these things these <laughs> days. And, you know, connection to my book and a little bit of biography and coaching and all that. So connect with Brett with one T.com and they can uh, figure out how to get in touch with me. Awesome. I'll leave that in the show notes as well. Thank you, Brett, for stopping by Word to the Wise. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great.